Uh, thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7641 in the name of Fergus Ewing on Scotland's food and drink strategy, Ambition 2030. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Fergus Ewing to speak and move the motion in Cabinet Secretary. 12 minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, Presiding officer, over the past few weeks, I have been a very lucky chap indeed. Because I have sampled in Granton and Spey, in the excellent uh, food and drink retail specialist Elephant and Castle, a nip of whiskey uh, from what I believe is the world's only community owned distillery, Glen Wivis. I recommend it to you all. I've also the opportunity to sample cider from Thistley Cross in Dunbar, a terrific success story, uh, and also seaweed from Mara Seaweed in Edinburgh, uh, and their seaweed being exported uh, to the USA, for example, is absolutely delicious. Members uh, may not know, I certainly didn't, that, uh, that seaweed for consumption is stored in barrels. Each barrel is worth $1,000, which means that one barrel of Scottish seaweed is worth 20 barrels of oil. Uh, and also, I've had the opportunity to launch a, a somewhat unusual statistic in the lexicon of Scottish Government statistics, uh, presiding officer. In launching the annual Food and Drink Fortnight, I had the, the world's most aesthetically pleasing, beautiful array of uh, breakfast uh, fare, uh, and delicious as well, uh, in the Barras in Glasgow. And these, these examples, and th in this debate, I know we all want to celebrate the, the excellence and entrepreneurial uh, uh, flair of businesses throughout the country, and all of us celebrate our local contribution to that. Uh, I think these examples typify what seems to be to be nothing short of a revolution in our food and drink sector. And I haven't frequently advocated revolution, but whatever our political views may be, presiding officer, about the desirability of revolution, I hope this one in food and drink is one that we can all today support. The success of the industry is indeed well known. Turnover is up 35% since 2007. Exports are at record levels. The birth rate of new businesses is higher in this sector than anywhere else in the UK. And it covers communities across the land. At the heart of this success has been our reputation, our brand, our provenance for high quality with our clean natural environment and our heritage. But none of this could be achieved without the passion, the dedication and the entrepreneurship of the thousands of people working across the industry. And I pay tribute to, to them. And when I meet these men and women, I'm always struck by their verve, their drive and their optimism. Uh, and with our ambition 2030, and Scotland's Food and Drink have produced this document here, which I'm not sure if the Code of Conduct allows me any more to, to do this, but, but there we are. Uh, You've already they, done it. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer, you spotted that. Uh, <laughs> but they're, they're right to be optimistic, because the industry is planning for the future, and it's doing so with high ambition, and it knows the demand for our products is rising, so we need to exploit these opportunities. And that's what the Food and Drink Strategy is about. Published earlier this year, this is a bold plan of action to grow the value of the industry to £30 billion by 2030. And this ambitious goal is one the Scottish Government supports. Over the past 10 years, we have worked hand in hand with the industry. The industry has told us that to fulfil its potential, it requires new thinking and new ways of doing things. And that's what led to the £10 million investment that we have made to support this strategy. Ambition 230 is founded on three pillars. First, people and skills. Secondly, innovation. And third, the supply chain. There already are, presiding officer, no less than 115,000 people employed across the country in this industry. And there will be, we believe, 27,000 new opportunities over the next decade. So it's vital we have people to meet this demand. Over the next year, a number of measures will be taken forward. Education programs, recruitment campaigns, and a new national mentoring program. The world is changing. Consumers increasingly want healthier food. This presents many opportunities for our businesses, but that does need innovation. So we've launched a single gateway for advice and support, making innovation happen. 
and this will be the platform from which we will build more action together with our excellent research institutions. Uh, the bedrock of the industry is, of course, our primary producers, and I think it's very important to remember that and explicitly accord to our farmers, our crofters, our fishermen, the credit, which is very easy to neglect to do, and that omission, I think, perhaps in the past, has been noticed. So I want to correct that and be clear about that. It is our farmers, our fishermen, our crofters that are producing the high quality food and drink and beverage. And let us never forget that and value and cherish that in the times ahead. Uh, but looking at the supply chain, it doesn't always function as it should. And our farmers must get a fair share of the margin. We need processors, retailers and food service to build on their good work and deepen their commitment to this. This will be a key part of the sector action plans that will be developed, starting with fruit and veg and seafood. Now on to markets. At the heart of the strategy is a clear focus on markets. Efforts in international markets are bearing fruit with record levels of exports in 16. And we also have presenting officer a network of what are called in-market specialists in 11 international cities. Uh, individuals whose job it is to be a sales force for Scotland's food and drink around the world. And I wanted to meet them and I recently did so and I was really impressed with their professionalism and their passion for Scotland as well as their market knowledge. Only last weekend our specialists in the USA secured a two month showcase of Scottish products in the high end retail store Bristol Farms. Uh, they have also introduced Californians to oat cakes, I believe, something which hitherto had not occurred. Uh, our specialists in France had recently secured a listing of Scottish cheeses by the famous French cheese wholesaler Desai, uh, and congratulations to Clarks on, on helping to secure that. And our specialists in Shanghai secured a listing of shortbread in over 200 stores of a large coffee chain across China. There are many more of these such achievements, and our in-market specialists are helping uh, to sell Scotland all over the world. This good work will continue, but we must focus on the UK and our home market. Many of our businesses are doing well in the UK market, but there's more potential, whether through retail, food service, or artisan markets. So Scotland Food and Drink is developing a UK market strategy, building on the things that have worked well in export markets. And this will include placing staff directly into the buying teams of retailers and food services. We know that this works. But to be successful further across the UK and international markets, we need a sound foundation at home. Interest and pride in our food and drink is flourishing. Scottish shoppers are increasingly, I believe, looking for local produce. Schools and hospitals are sourcing more locally. And visitors are more interested in our food and drink. So we need to do two things. First, we need to ensure there's a sustainable and productive farming sector which underpins the food and drink industry and our four agricultural champions are taking forward work to help achieve this. <coughs> uh, yes, I'm happy to. Mark Ruskell. <coughs> the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, and I welcome the establishment of the four champions. But do you not think we need to add another champion in there, a champion for environment, a champion for landscape, a champion for all the amazing environmental works which Scottish agriculture actually delivers? Well, we already have Cabinet a, Secretary. We already have a champions in the environmental group, which uh, my colleague and friend Rosanna Cunningham tabled and met at the summit last year and who are shortly to meet again. Uh, and we of course have on the National Council of Advisors, uh, as I'm sure the member knows, uh, the Agricultural Development Officer of the Soil Association. And the Soil Association is at the very heart of the environment, uh, presiding officer. Uh, so the champions work has a broad focus on agriculture, but will also consider the wider rural environmental and economic impacts. This complements work being taken forward by other stakeholders groups, uh, such as I just mentioned, the Environment and Climate Change Roundtable, whose membership includes the RSPB, the WWF, and Friends of the Earth. Secondly, we need to increase demand for locally produced food and drink. Our program for government set out a number of commitments to support this, and today I published a paper providing more detail of the range of actions that we'll take forward with industry. And these cover three main areas. First, public food. Progress has been made to increase local sourcing in schools, hospitals, and prisons. 48% sourced to Scottish, 
an increase from 41% in 2007 progress made. Our colleagues in the NHS and Scotland XL are committed to doing more, and together we've identified actions that will have the most impact. So there'll be a focus on supplier development. Our programme will support 30 businesses with real growth potential to better compete for public sector contracts and exploit other market opportunities. Building our business capability is key if we want them to grow, diversify. And our expansion of the Food for Life programme across schools has the potential to transform local supply chains. Our new investment of £1 million over the next three years will have local sourcing at its heart. Now, this requires support from local authorities, and I will personally continue to work with them to encourage greater take-up, and I hope other members will add their support too. Secondly, we'll build on the good work that's been done to enhance the experience for visitors and tourists, including innovative businesses. Uh, for example, in uh, the Highlands and Islands, in the constituency of Rhoda Grant, the, the uh, Black Owl Brewery, for example, or the Cairngorm Brewery. Uh, uh, and uh, they have, of course, increasingly played a part in tourism as well as food and drink. Last year, over 14 million visitors came to Scotland, and that number is rising. And globally, food tourism is a growing industry. So we will work with Visit Scotland and in March publish the first National Food and Drink Tourism Action Plan. This will set out actions across a number of areas, including expanding the food charter across the hospitality interest and visitor attractions, and enhancing the Taste Our Best Quality Assurance Scheme awarded to restaurants, cafes, and hotels. And thirdly, we will showcase the very best of Scotland's regions through a series of events and target support to local producers. One of our strengths is the diversity of our regions and their unique food production. So, over the next two years, we will create six regional showcasing events to, produce, to promote the region's finest produce to domestic buyers. These events will be a celebration of local producers connecting businesses with buyers. These events are very, very successful, uh, presiding officer. We will also launch a new regional food fund to give small producers an opportunity to access grants to help generate interest. Um, commenting briefly on the, on the amendments, I, I want to be as consensual as possible, as you, as you know is always the case, uh, presenting officer. So uh, I've decided that we will certainly accept the Labour amendment to, uh, to ensure that more beer is, uh, is displayed in, uh, in, in our shops and our supermarkets. And I commend the, uh, the process that Brakes have made in supporting craft brewers and the success they've already achieved. Um, I would like to have supported the Tories amendment, honestly. Uh, and of course, we want to support more productive and profitable farming. Of course, we do much of our devoted to that. I think the bit about business rates at the end is a bit unclear. And I know that uh, the Tories will in any event welcome the fact that uh, we have not re supported the Barclay recommendation to make agricultural buildings uh, on the valuation roll, nor have we supported that recommendation to make food processing and farms rateable. Uh, and I believe that's been wet. I think that's common ground. But I thought that it was a bit of vagueness at the end, which was a bit of a shame because I'm such a consensual chap. Turning to <laughs> Mr. Rumble's amendment, um, I think his heart is in the right place. We all know that, presiding officer. But I think his uh, the interpretation of the previous amendment that Parliament passed is, is uh, a, a somewhat idiosyncratic. Because, uh, because, you see, he called for Parliament to have an independent group. And that's what we have done. But then he says we must have a group of stakeholders. Well, if you have a group of stakeholders, it's not really an independent group, is it? Uh, and moreover, I, I believe I've demonstrated that we have a wide range covering forestry and environment, tourism, on the group, and if you look at the excellent the CVs of the excellent people, one can see I want to that. be consensual too, Cabinet Secretary, but you must wind up and move your motion. I will always support you, Presiding Officer. <laughs> That's not moving the motion. I'm moving my motion Thank as well. you very much. I call Evelyn Mountain to speak and move Amendment 7641.3. Mr Mountain, please, eight minutes or thereabouts. Presiding Officer, thank you. I'd like to refer members to my register of interest. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary was in a brilliant mood when he started this and, and, and finished his speech slightly less brilliantly, unable to say that he would support our amendment. Maybe he lifts, if he listens carefully to what I'm about to say, he will find it easier to do so. Do so. Before I move my amendment, I would, however, like to make a statement in my capacity as convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. 
The committee unanimously agreed yesterday, given the importance of food and drink to Scotland, that we would focus part of our scrutiny of this year's budget on this area. I believe that is a real acknowledgement of the importance of this subject. Presiding officer, I do move the amendment in my name. And I'd like to say that a fair time ago, uh, Scottish cuisine had become something of a joke amongst comedians. Thanks to characters like Rabsy Nesbitt, it appeared that the traditional Scottish dining experience started and ended in the deep fat fryer. So I'm very happy to see that Scottish food and drink has earned itself a vastly more positive reputation in the last 10 years. Whether it's the beef and barley that come from Strathspey, the soft fruit that come from the alluvial plains of Perthshire, the distinctive sheep and cattle that come from the highlands, or the fish delivered by a fisherman, we have one of the best natural larders in the world. And we believe we need to use it wisely. We need a sustainable harvest without depleting the environment. I welcome the progress that has been, we have seen since the strategy was launched in 2007. Much of it can be put down to the design of Scotland's Food and Drink Partnership, a collaborative model which has brought together government, public agencies and indeed industry. There is a good lesson, I believe, to be learnt from this partnership. It has found the right balance between ensuring that the government knows and is told when to step forward and when to step back to give the sector the freedom it needs when it steps back, to allow industry to lead innovations. And I believe the Scottish Government must ensure that they remember this when designing other schemes to support rural businesses. And I make a plea to the Cabinet Secretary, please do not let us repeat the administrative burdens that we've seen in the beef efficiency scheme. Now, credit where credit is due. The achievements of Scotland Food and Drink Partnership includes increasing turnover by 44%, exports up by 56%, and an industry worth £14.4 billion. This is the type of economic growth that will always find cross-party support. But success doesn't mean that it all is perfect. <clears throat> Far from it. If we look carefully at the statistics, there are one or two concerning trends. Annual turnover peaked in 2014 and has fallen from the 14.4 billion down to the 13.5 billion. Employment in the sector has fallen. And therefore, this renewed purpose for the Scotland Drink, Food and Drink Partnership growth strategy could not have arrived sooner in my mind. We welcome the ambition stated in the new growth strategy to resolve the skills shortages in the sector and to double the annual takeover by 2030. A laudable target. But this can be reached only as long as the Scottish Government focus and delivers in the following areas. Firstly, I believe the Scottish Government must do more to ensure that farm gate prices are realistic. To paraphrase the words of Andrew McCormick, the President of NFU Scotland, farmers and growers and crofters need to benefit from the huge growth that has taken place in the food and drink industry. I'm afraid they don't. Farm incomes have fallen by 75% since 2011, and 59%... I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr Mountain. I'm getting strange signals. Could you like to tell me what's wrong? Sorry? Oh, it's nothing. It's something that they can't hear properly over there. Is that correct? Well, we'll, we'll tell broadcasting. I'll give you an extra bit. Just, sorry, continue. Sorry. No, I, I hope you weren't missing my words. I can start again, if you like. <laughs> no, 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 please, we heard it. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. I start off from where I left. They don't. Farm incomes have fallen by 75% 2000, since 2011, and 59% of farmers make less than the minimum agricultural wage per hour. The dairy industry is perhaps the best example where farmers just get such a low gate price, it doesn't reflect the, the effort they've put in. Without realistic prices for produce, farmers cannot invest and then increase their production to supply the needs of a growing food and drink sector. We must encourage our farmers and fishermen to get a fair price for what the, they produce. Processing and retailing, in my mind, must understand they need producers. So they must reward them or production will surely stall and shrivel. Now, I welcome the new strategy as identified that profitability must be a lot through the supply chain. It is always easy to declare your ambitions, but much harder to deliver to them. We need more detail on how this will be achieved. 
The Bank of Scotland's Food and Drink report for 2017 stated 62% of Scottish firms would be prepared to pay a higher price to primary producers based in Scotland to guarantee security of supply and maintain the product, providence of their products. We need to know how the Scottish Government will ensure this happens. And that brings me to my second point. The simplest way to ensure that farm businesses can be more profitable is to create an environment which stimulates economic growth. But that won't be possible under a business rate re regime which disadvantages, in our mind, the hospitality and food and drink sectors. You cannot have your oat cake and eat it. Restricted business rates are incompatible with high economic growth. I urge the Scottish Government to look again and try to take more action to reduce high business rates for the hospitality and food and drink industry. Thirdly, and lastly, the Scottish Government and local government must make greater strides in supporting producers sourcing Scottish food, quality Scottish food and drink. If we are serious about making Scotland a good food nation, then we must ensure that the public sector leads the way in championing high quality produce locally produced and delivering it to our schools and our hospitals. This has been talked about in this Parliament since 2007. We don't seem to have progressed much. The 2014 procurement bill paved the way for the public sector to deliver on its promise and to source and serve local Scottish produce. Time to deliver. The Scottish Government has taught the talk. Time to walk the walk and let's get results. Presiding officer, the Scottish, uh, Scottish Conservatives welcome many of the ambitions of the 2030 strategy for the Scottish food and drink sector. But the Scottish Government needs to understand, to achieve the targets we all want and Scotland needs, we must, first of all, ensure primary producers are rewarded and are profitable, ensure business rates for the sector don't stifle growth, and local produce becomes the first choice of us all, not only at home, but in our schools and hospitals and wherever else they are supplied by the public and private sector. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, uh, Mr Mountain. I call Rhoda Grant uh, to speak to move Amendment 7641.17 minutes or thereabouts, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, food and drink is a hugely valuable um, to Scot the Scottish economy. We have a worldwide rec recognition for the quality of our produce. We must protect and build on this reputation because it leads to a premium price for our produce and so a better deal for all our producers. We have iconic products such as Scottish whisky, the Arbroath Smoky, Orkney Scottish Island Cheddar and the Stornoway Black Pudding, which have had a small part in protecting. These premium products are, have rightly earned their place in the Foodie Hall of Fame, so much so that they need to be protected from those who would imitate the brand and thereby damage its status. Protection was one of the benefits we got from being part of the European Union. The process began with a member state, but ended up with European protection. And I wonder what thought has been given to continuing that protection beyond Brexit as part of new trade agreements within Europe and indeed the wider world. Loss of protection for these brands could have a financial impact on the industries who have built a reputation for excellence by impacting on the premium they currently earn. Much of our food is recognised as excellent due to the environment and our drive for sustainability. That our fish and meat comes from some of the most natural of origins is recognised the world over. Again, much of this has been achieved by adhering to European legislation for environmental protection. And again, we must not allow that to be threatened by Brexit. We need to maintain and build on these standards of excellence. And we must showcase our food, lo our food locally as well. Not so long ago, it was difficult to source uh, local produce in shops and restaurants here. And that has changed and local produce is becoming more available in our restaurant. But restaurants, but there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure it's available in shops so that local people and visitors can enjoy it alike. Turning to our amendment, too often tied pubs are limited in what they can sell. They're normally forced to sell the brand of beer produced by the brewery that own the pub, and this does not necessarily meet customer demand. This beer is often sold to the licensee at an inflated price, cutting their profit margins as well as their customer's choice. 
And we've all seen tourists asking for a local beer in a pub and also witnessed their disappointment at the lack of that choice. Many beer drinkers are akin to foodies when it comes to trying the local beer as part of their holiday experience. And if it's not available, they will go elsewhere. And it also leaves them with a bad impression of the whole area that they've been visiting. We also miss the opportunity to showcase our local beers, and that could lead to their expansion by opening up different, um, uh, different markets. We have a growing industry in Scotland of artisanal breweries and should be helping them grow their market share. My colleague Neil Bibby is looking to legislate against the, against the excesses of tied pubs with the aim of providing more choice for customers and more leeway for the licensee. And I hope that Neil will take the time in his winding up speech to explain a little more about what he is proposing in his bill and how it will benefit all of those interested in protecting our pubs and, traditional, so, and the traditional so, social setting they provide. But our, our amendment to date does not go as far as his proposed bill, but it does ask the Parliament to agree that Scottish beer should have a bigger share of the market. Turning to the other amendments, we agree with the Conservative amendment that we should be doing all we can to remove barriers to growth. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance has said that he will consider a range of recommendations arising from the Barclay Re Review in the forthcoming budget. So whilst we have sympathy with the position put by Edward Mountain, we will await their budget with interest and therefore will not support their motion at this time. The Liberal Democrat motion points out the limited membership of the National Council for Rural Advisors, and that's something that we too have been critical about. I can't understand a cabinet secretary who represents Inverness and Nairn appointing a council of advisors, none of whom live north of Perth. If he knows anything about his constituency, he surely understands the challenges of farming and crofting and the food and drink industry are very different the further north you go now. Cabinet secretary. Uh, I mean, the the Council is, as Parliament asked, independent, so it doesn't cover every area, every sector or stakeholder interest, but it does include, as, it, as its co-chair, Lorne Creer, who, uh, as Rhoda Grant well knows, is the chair of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, who has a home in the Highlands uh, and who has impeccable knowledge and expertise about the whole range of the rural economy in the Highlands and Islands. Rhoda Grant. He, he may have a home in the Highlands and Islands. He's not normally Highlands and Islands based, and he is not part of that industry. And I think what the people in the Highlands and Islands are missing is somebody who works in the food and drink industry and in farming or crofting, who knows how difficult that is on the front line and can bring that knowledge and experience to the council. So therefore, because of that, we will be supporting the Liberal Democrat amendment tonight. Presiding officer, if we talk about the excellence and uh, the premium pr given by our produce, but we need a food and drink strategy that looks at a right to food as well. Too many people are feeding their families out of food, food banks, not just those on benefits, but those at work too. And we need to eradicate the need for food banks. People need an income that allows them to eat a nutritious diet. Too often we see unhealthy food and being cheap and available, while healthier food alternatives are way out of the reach of some families. And we see the growth of health conditions, indeed conditions we thought were long gone, due to malnutrition, something our grandparents had thought they had eradicated and would be disappointed to see coming back. A living wage social security benefits at a level that allow parents to feed their children are surely something we must all aspire to. While we can rightly boast about wonderful produce, we need to make sure that all our citizens benefit from it. We have a similar debate to this every year during Food and Drink Fortnight, and normally a nice debate giving everyone the opportunity to highlight excellence in their own constituencies. However, this year our producers are facing real challenges such as cap payments and Brexit all crucial to our food and drink industry. Therefore, we must find solutions to put this valuable industry back on a stable footing. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, can I ask you please to move your amendment? Amendment. amendment. Thank you very much. I now call Mike Rumbles to speak to and move amendment 7641.2. Mr Rumbles, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As the three contributors to this debate so far have mentioned, Scotland's food and drink industry is a real success story. 
There are so many aspects to our food and drink industry that I want to concentrate in the short time I have available on one important element of it, the Scotch whisky industry. At the moment, this industry adds some five billion pounds to Scotland's economy. It's particularly important to our rural areas, providing some 7,000 local jobs in areas where there may not be a vast array of alternative employment opportunities. I've had the pleasure over my years as an MSP from the northeast of Scotland of visiting several distilleries in my area, the latest of which was my local distillery at Knethmont in Aberdeenshire. It isn't just the number of, in, of direct jobs which are supported by whisky production, but the added value to the tourist industry which it provides. Now, it's a good thing that more and more distilleries are adding visitor centres to capture the tourist market, and this has to be a good development for all concerned. So, after acknowledging the success story of our Scottish food and drink industry, by particularly highlighting the contribution of Scotch whisky, I now want to turn my attention to the future of the food and drinks industry as a whole. Now, I make no apology for now focusing on what I have been asking the Cabinet Minister for Rural Development to do for the last 15 months and to which my amendment today refers. As soon as the people of the UK voted to leave the European Union some 15 months ago, I urged the Cabinet Secretary to set up a group of experts to design a bespoke system of agricultural support for the future of our industry without delay. Back in January of this year, I was pleased when Fergus Ewing accepted my amendment in a debate calling for the setting up of such a group. But, presiding, Deputy Presiding Officer, you weren't in the chair at the time, but when uh, Fergus Ewing mentioned, I mean, I did find it amusing when he mentioned that he said it was me that had misinterpreted the amendment. It was actually my amendment. So I don't think I misinterpreted it. Could it be that it's the Cabinet Secretary that um, doesn't listen properly? However, when he announced his National Council of Rural Advisors at the Royal Highland Show on June the 22nd, I was somewhat disappointed to see the very narrow scope and backgrounds of the people he chose. Now, I want to say that all these people are worthy people in their field. I have no criticism of any of them being involved in the process. But, yes, there is a but, and it's a big but. Uh, but what a missed opportunity. Not only has it taken a year to establish such a group, wasting in the process valuable time, but Fergus Ewing has chosen them from a very narrow field. Where are the people from our environmental organisations, our consumer groups, and other non-farming producers, such as, as, as Rhoda Grant mentioned, crofting? If we are to design a bespoke system of agricultural support for our food and drinks industry post-Brexit, then we need to ensure that everyone has a buy-in to it. If we choose a council of advisors from, from very similar backgrounds in the agricultural industry, farming industry, to design a new system, then I think that we're setting up to fail in this essential task, which I don't want us to do. Yes, of course. Fair I, mean, I, I think I agree with the sentiments Mr. Rumble says, but I don't agree that the, the membership of the National Council of Rural Advisors is narrow in any way, and I would respectfully suggest Mr. Rumbles look very carefully at the curriculum vitae of people who display distinction and eminence in a large number of areas. And also I think, although there are several farmers, they are people who look after the landscape. They are the custodians of the countryside. To say that somehow there's an artificial divide between farmers and environmentalists, I think is a tad unfair to farmers individually and collectively. But can I reassure Mr. Rumbles by saying that we have written I have written to 236 stakeholders to ask them to contribute to this work. Scottish Environment Link have already done so. It is for the independent group to decide how to take forward the work when I meet them next week and to, to decide what to do. But they will, I believe, be likely to engage with the stakeholders. And his motion didn't say, presiding officer, back in January, that the group should, should uh, comprise stakeholders it said we should involve stakeholders. Signing off, sir, that's what we've done. That's what we're doing. That's what we will do. Well, I can allow you some extra time for a, a long intervention. Thank you Mr. very Rumbles. much, Deputy President. And it was indeed a long intervention, which I'm happy that, that I, I took from the, from the Minister. I do indeed have in my hands the curriculum vitae of all the members of the Council. And if anybody cares to read them, they are all distinguished people. I said already that I have no criticism of those people involved in the council. But they do come, if you examine them carefully, 
from a very narrow scope. And you talked about an artificial divide. There isn't an artificial divide, but what we need is inclusivity in here. We need consumer groups, we need environmentalist groups, not just from the focus that's here. So I would urge Fergus Ewing to enter into the spirit of what I thought he had accepted back in January, that we need the contributions of experts from as wide a field as possible, but certainly including producer groups, environmental organizations and consumers to advise him on what is needed for the future of our food and drinks industry. Now, it isn't yet too late to enlarge the National Council advisors to encompass experts in these fields. I'm not arguing that people should be dropped from it. Far from it. He needs to include people. We all want this to succeed. There's nobody in this chamber wants this to fail. We want it to actually succeed. And the best way to make it succeed is to listen to others, Minister, and to, to, and to listen to what the groups who are all involved in this process have to say. If we all get buy-in, we will succeed. So I'd urge him to change tack on this. Presiding mm -hmm. officer, too much time has been wasted in this process. What we need from the Cabinet Secretary is action on this. I urge him to change his mind for the good of the food and drinks industry. We all want to see it succeed. Would you move your amendment, please, Mr oh, Rumbles? I'm Willie Mehmet in my name. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of four minutes, please. Graham Day to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, Presiding officer, earlier this week I visited Gruers, a farm shop in my constituency, to mark this year's Scottish Food and Drink Fortnight. It was a very appropriate choice. Innovation is a word that features repeatedly in the Ambition 2030 strategy. Gruers as a farm business epitomise innovation. In October 2014, they installed their first vending machine at East Adler Farm to answer local demand for their potatoes. Utilising an accompanying suggestion box, customers were quick to ask for a wider variety of fresh produce direct from the farm. So carrots, onions, broccoli and free-range eggs were quickly sourced from neighbours, friends and family to broaden the range. Three further vending machines were installed at Dronley Farm, where the shop was established in 2015, the Overgate Shopping Centre in Dundee and St John's Shopping Centre in Perth. And here for me is the best bit. The farm shop, which also offers a range of Scottish craft gins, vodkas and beers, makes an absolute virtue of the food miles travelled by the products on sale, providing a distance breakdown for each of the many items which have been sourced from within a 20-mile radius. Visit Gruers and you know you're not just buying top-quality Scottish produce, you're supporting local businesses and sourcing products which haven't been travelled many tens, indeed hundreds of miles, or worse still, left Scotland to be packaged before being returned here. Another innovator or entrepreneur, if you like, in my constituency is Kim Cameron, the driving force behind the gin bothy and the cider bothy products. The strategy talks of the need for collaboration. Kim initially bought in gin from a business in Perth. She's now working with Graham Jarron of Ogilvy Vodka, based in nearby Guams, to produce her own base spirit and has expanded the business to establish the gin lather on the outskirts of Kerry Muir, where visitors can experience gin tasting in a bothy setting with all the traditional trappings. Gruers and Kim Cameron aren't resting on their laurels either, mirroring the ambition of the strategy, both have plans to expand and in so doing, tap into the tourism market. Scotland's blessed with so many innovators like these in the food and drink sector. I'm sure as the afternoon unfolds, we'll be reminded of this by contributions from other colleagues. Um, but of course, innovation very often needs to be enabled. And I want to acknowledge the role of government, national and local in that. Scotland Food and Drink, uh, my colleague Richard Lockhead, when he served as Rural Affairs Secretary in the last Parliament, and now Fergus Ewing, does it deserve enormous credit for facilitating the growth of the sector. But let me take this opportunity also to place on the record my appreciation of the work done in my own constituency by Angus Council officials, Alison Smith and Hilary Tasker, who have not only facilitated the boom in food and drink there, but driven it. The latest manifestation of the Council's support for the food and drink offering of the county is the Taste of Angus Food Charter, which aims to promote the use of local food through cafes, restaurants, public bodies, community groups, shops and individuals. It sets out to support local food and drinks businesses and farmers create a healthier food culture in Angus, which will result in the availability of higher quality and tastier food for residents and visitors alike. Anyone can sign up. All they need to do is pledge to make small or large changes in the food they buy, sell, cook or eat, thereby strengthening, amongst other things, the local economy, shorter supply chains and environmental sustainability. 
Presiding officer, the strategy talks of the need to unlock the sector's potential by looking both outwards and inwards. We're going great guns in Angus in terms of businesses that are selling beyond Scotland and in some cases well beyond Europe. But sitting alongside that, we're also seeking to raise awareness closer to home of what's on offer on our own doorstep. And with the tourism boost expected to follow the opening of the V&A in Dundee, gearing up to ensure that visitors to Angus are sampling the best of our food and drink offering with all the spin-off benefits that could have. And we're also meeting the continuing challenges noted in the document around deepening collaboration, diversifying markets and customer bases, supporting resilience in the sector and driving forward sustainability. Achieving the growth ambitions of the strategy will require all parts of Scotland and every sector to raise their game still further. President Officer, Angus is ready to do that. Thank you. Ryan Whittle to be followed by Gail Ross. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I am delighted to take this opportunity to speak in this important debate. And I would like to thank uh, Fergus Ewing for setting me on a path uh, of my interest in public food procurement, because it was during one of the many Brexit Tuesday debates last term that daring to suggest that perhaps we should take the opportunity to look at how sourcing of food and drink in the public procurement sector that the Cabinet Secretary got to his feet and puffed out his chest like all great orators do and could, and I quote, has Mr Whittle heard of Scotland Excel and is he aware of its work? Does he appreciate that a great many farming businesses recognise that Excel as a procurement policy ensure that to a great extent food produced is bought in Scotland from Scottish producers and farmers? Now I'm not sure if the Cabinet Secretary actually didn't know the details of the Scotland Excel contract or he was hoping that I would take my telling and drop it and leave it leave with my tail between my legs. However, suitably chastised, I did take some time to investigate where the food that we serve to our children in schools and patients in hospitals is sourced, only to discover, as was ultimately reported on the BBC, large quantities of food and drink eminently available from our food producers is imported from around the world. Chicken from Thailand, flash-dried mashed potato, or root vegetables and fruit and meat and dairy produce, among, among the many products that are all imported. So it seems although we legislate to ensure that our farmers produce the highest quality of food and we ensure that they pay the living wage, we charge them with the custodianship of the countryside and demand the highest animal welfare. The SNP government procurement policy through Scotland Excel prefers to purchase cheaper produce, not subject to the rules we impose on our food producers. I would be delighted. Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, th thank him for his, his remarks. And can I just remind him that uh, in the opening comments, I did say that we have substantially increased the proportion, the percentage of, of uh, locally sourced produce that is now procured in the public sector from 41 to 48 percent. And of course, that's not enough. But we are making considerable progress. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, we can all surely unite in agreeing that the task is now to do even better. Brian, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his remarks and I look forward to the evidence uh, to back that up uh, and, and I think Deputy Presiding Officer uh, you're right we do have an opportunity here, uh, opportunity here an opportunity to scrutinise the health of our rural economy and part of that scrutiny should focus within our own borders and what can be done to ensure that we support our fishermen and farmers wherever possible. We should also be looking at how our food is processed and packaged too much is shipped out of Scotland to be processed and packaged only to be then imported back in again for consumption. Surely we need to look at developing that capability here within our own shores. Not only will this type of approach deliver a better opportunity for our rural economy to establish the stability it craves, it also has a major part to play in long-term health strategy that Scotland so desperately needs. Locally produced high quality food and drink making its way to the school and hospital kitchens and dining halls should be an obvious direction of travel for any government. This debate quite rightly highlights the quality and high standard of food produced in Scotland. We are rightly proud of our global reputation in the food and drink sector. So why then are we, as the Scottish Government, being less than emphatic when it comes to putting that produce on Scottish tables? This isn't just about what we eat at home. It's about our schools and hospitals, or even our prisons. Places where delivering nutritious, high quality, locally sourced meals can have a real impact on things like health, attainment, and mental health. And we know it can be done. Councillors like East Ayrshire have a real focus on local procurement, but it's very much a case of that being the exception rather than the rule. 
We don't just hold our farmers to a high standard. We hold them up to the world for their excellence. But while the world is impressed, our farm will struggle to get their produce in the school a mile down the road. Deputy Presiding Officer, food and drink are unquestionably a key part of the Scottish economy, but they're also a role to play in Scotland's health and even Scotland's identity. I urge the Scottish Government to take this opportunity to review their procurement policy for the benefit of our fishermen and farmers. Thank you. Gail Ross, please be followed by Marie Goujon. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. Ambition 2030, Scotland's food and drink strategy is deliberately ambitious. At the moment, our food and drink sector is worth £14.4 billion. Whiskey and salmon are two biggest exports. But the strategy aims to double the value of the food and drink sector by 2030. So how do we do it? It's not without its challenges, but the key lies in collaboration. Thanks to the last 10 years of the Scotland Food and Drink Partnership, joint working in the industry has become commonplace, and it is working. No longer do farming, fishing and other food and drink producers work alone in silos. They convene at trade shows throughout the EU and the world. They market themselves differently. They are Scotland PLC. Scotland's market is being promoted on the international stage. But as I said, it's not without its challenges. The issue of skilled workers in the food and drink sector is one that needs to be addressed. Traditionally, attracting young people to work in the industry has been a demanding task. And looking ahead, as the Cabinet Secretary said, Skills Development Scotland estimate that there will be 27,000 job opportunities over the next 10 years, with a range of roles from practical hands-on to managerial posts. The question for many constituencies, including my own, is how to fill these job opportunities, particularly given the challenges posed by the UK leaving the EU. Scotland Food and Drink and Skills Development Scotland launched a skills investment plan in January that looks at how we can fill these jobs. They work with local schools to educate our young people on growing and cooking food and what careers are available in the industry. And I was delighted last week to hear Minister for Employability and Training, Jamie Hepburn, MSP, announce a foundation apprenticeship in food and drink. I had asked that very question of James Withers at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on the 31st of May. It's essential that we show our young people that a career in the industry is a valuable and a rewarding one. Presiding Officer, one of the aims of the strategy and also one of our manifesto commitments is to move towards becoming a good food nation with the introduction of a good food nation bill. We want to see healthy, locally grown produce available for all. We want to see schools with allotments growing, cooking and selling their own produce, learning about where their food comes from and how it's produced. We want to see local healthy choices in our schools, hospitals and other public places. Ethical sourcing, fresh, seasonal, seasonal local sustainable produce. And we want to inspire future generations to be proud of and to contribute to Scotland as the land of food and drink. As the strategy says, the key areas of a good food nation are health and well-being, environmental sustainability, local economic prosperity, resilient communities, and fairness in the food chain. I have met and will continue to meet with producers, community groups, NGOs, and individuals to discuss this bill. I spoke about it at our SNP conference last year I met with Jamie Oliver a couple of weeks ago and we discussed possible ways forward and how Scotland can and does do things differently. And as Councillor Heather Anderson says, the attainment gap can only be closed by closing the nutrition gap. It's about land use, social justice, education and health. I think the Good Food Nation Bill could be one of the most exciting and important pieces of legislation that we could pass in this Parliament. In the meantime, we need both public and private sector to come together to continue to grow the industry and realise our 2030 ambition. Thank you. I call Marie Goujon to be followed by John Scott.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's an absolute pleasure and I'm absolutely delighted to take part in this debate today on food and drink because I think it's impossible to talk about this sector and not be excited at all the opportunities that are. Uh, I was a, a councillor with Angus Council in the past. I had responsibility for economic development for the local authority and had the absolute pleasure of working with the team that Graham Day mentioned, Alison Smith and Hilary Tasker. And because it was all about encouraging people to, and their businesses to visit, invest in and live in the region. And a massive part of that work was also to promote and sell the best of our products to the rest of Scotland and beyond, uh, such as Glen Cadham whiskey in my own uh, hometown of Brechin, the Forfar Bridie, which I think I described to one foreign audience as a meaty puff of heaven. So if anybody still hasn't tried one of these meaty puff of heaven and would like to do so, then please contact me, I'll sort you out. Um, and now I represent part of Aberdeenshire too, and I have even more to shout about in that region. We have, quite simply, some of the best produce to be found anywhere in the world. And that's why I very much welcome the motion brought forward today. But what I would like to focus on is what we can do locally within our own communities in terms of strengthening local food supply chains. Because while looking to international markets is, of course, vitally important, we have to look at strengthening the links between our farmers, fishermen, primary producers, and getting their products to our communities so people know about and choose the local produce, and it is far more readily available and easy to find. Now, this has been the ambition of an entirely innovative collective launched last year in Angus called The Food Life. Now, The Food Life is a group of farmers, retailers, food vendors and educators who aim to promote the produce of the region to those who live there and to visitors. But they're not just about promotion of the product. It's about our health and encouraging a healthier way of life. To do that, they educate, they conduct their own pilot schemes and research because I don't think we can consider food in terms of our rural economy alone. And that's why I've been glad to hear health mentioned a few times today, because it feeds into so many other areas. And health is a vital part of that. And I think we could be doing more uh, to make those links clearer. I was also pleased to hear Rhoda Grant mention some of the points that she raised in terms of food banks, because what can we do to make sure that the people who uh, can least afford food have, and have to use food banks have access to fresh, healthy, local produce? Now, as well as holding their own markets and food events, the Food Life also look at how to connect businesses to the local food supply chain. And again, that's why I was glad to hear some of the issues that have been raised by Brian Whittle, because one massive stumbling block in achieving this has been the procurement process. Uh, local companies with healthy, fresh offerings who reach a block when trying to provide their product to, say, local schools. And more needs to be done to address that. And I welcome some of the comments that were made by the Cabinet Secretary in his opening statement today. We should be making it easier for local food producers to get their produce into our communities, getting them through the barriers that exist in local authorities, arm's length organisations and the NHS. And of course, I don't think we can talk about the importance of the food and drink sector without talking about some of the challenges that we face with Brexit. There's the rural development programme worth 1.3 billion to Scotland, not to mention the importance of the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund to our coastal communities. With these funding streams only guaranteed for the immediate future, we need to know what's going to come in their place. We also need to know what happens if we are no longer in the single market or the customs union. How will that affect getting our product to the market? And beyond that is also the issue that hangs over our EU citizens who come to work in the various uh, areas within food and drink because it is an area which needs people. In Angus alone, more than half of all uh, people working in the agricultural sector at the moment are expected to retire within the next 10 to 15 years. So we need high levels of new entrants just to maintain the employment levels we have at the moment, let alone what, should, what could be coming further down the line. And just to conclude, I would say that we're all lucky enough to be here representing constituencies and a country that is home to some of the best produce in the world. We have the product, the ambitions there. We just need to navigate some of the political obstacles that are coming uh, to make this a real success. Thank you. John Scott to be followed by Emma Harper. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and food producer as well as remind members of my interest in the development of farmers' markets in Scotland, and I am a paid-up member of the National Farmers' Union of Scotland. Presiding Officer, I'd like to begin by welcoming this debate on Scotland's food and drink strategy, Ambition 2030, and congratulate the Scottish food and drink industry on their remarkable success thus far. Our whisky industry leads the charge of success 
and the enormous diversity of their product is one of its key strengths. Our fish farming industry has boosted both output and profitability in the past year and sustains around 7,000 jobs in the most remote and peripheral parts of Scotland, vital in socio-economic terms as well as food production. Our livestock farmers deliver world-class beef and lamb as well as sustain our landscapes and our environment. So congratulations are the order of the day to the industry and what it has achieved thus far. However, a point I would want to make to the Cabinet Secretary is the very real threat to this remarkable success story, and that threat is the lack of profitability in this supply chain for the primary producer, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks in this regard this afternoon. But abattoirs across Scotland are having difficulty sourcing quality cattle because suckler herds are not profitable. Butter has now reached £6,000 per tonne in price because dairy farmers have not had a decent return from the market for too long, alluded to by Edward Mountain. And sheep farming lacks profitability too, and these different sectors are all gradually reducing their output, which is a real risk to processors and retailers who so value the primary products, which gives them their provenance and marketing story to tell, but who nonetheless are not yet giving a fair share of the margin to the primary producers. However, on a more positive note, I believe that there is also a significant job to be done in developing the regionalisation of our food product. The French have been doing this for years, where the concept is elegantly known as terroir, which roughly translated means of the land or of the region. Wine from Bordeaux is different from wine from the Rhone, while cheese from the Haute Savoie is different from cheese from Brittany. And it is the diversity of the product which, as I already noted, is the strength of our whisky industry that gives French food and wine re its retailing market and strength. And my point is that we too could and should develop this concept in our food industry in Scotland, establish brands such as Ayrshire Tatties or Both Smoky, Starnaway Black Pudding and the many others are the building blocks to further develop this concept. And the reality is that regional diversity adds to the food buying choice and experience for our customers at home and abroad, as well as adding provenance and therefore value to what is being sold. And again, I welcome Fergus Ewing's mm -hmm. intentions in this regard announced this afternoon. Developing the purchasing experience for our customers gave farmers markets the boost that allowed them to become established again in Scotland and this enhanced experience should be further developed and built on by creating covered producer markets as found in almost every sizable town in France and Spain. Use the magnificent food hall at the Highland Show as a template and create cooperative ventures through SAOS on permanent sites in Glasgow and Edinburgh and get the ball rolling and shorten the supply chain from farm gate to plate. And Gail Roll Gail Ross is absolutely right to suggest that this be done by more cooperation and collaborative working. In addition, there are barriers to be removed, such as punitive levels of business rates, for example, levied on our livestock auction marts and processing plants. There are, as others have said, too few new entrants coming into both the farming and the processing sector as unemployment falls and competition grows to persuade willing young people to make a career, perhaps through apprenticeships, in our dynamic food producing, processing and retail sector. However, these are obstructions which can be overcome and the willingness of the industry to play its part is a credit to them. Now, government must do its part to further remove barriers and to growth and help create an incentivised fiscal framework to allow this track record of success to continue to grow. Thank you. Emma Harper, followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to remind Chamber that I am the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary, Mr Ewing. And as Scotland's food and drink industry is closely linked with tourism, I will also refer members to my register of interest as part owner of a bed and breakfast before I continue. Our food and drink industry in Scotland is vital to the rural economy, and I'm delighted to welcome the Scottish Government's ambitious plan to expand it further. Building our nation's brand will be key to achieving the same. Many people are becoming increasingly aware of how important the provenance and sustainability are to the industry. 
And I recently read a survey from DEFRA which showed 7 out of 10 people said that buying sustainable food is important, but yet only 30% of those folks buy sustainable produce. The key reason for this is because a third of those people aren't sure how to choose sustainable food products and are confused by labelling. This indicates the importance of education and clear labelling, including country of origin labelling. Country of origin labelling was an issue raised with me by NFU leadership this summer. Um, a response for Madame Goujon. Uh, in South Scotland region, we also have fantastic produce produced by extremely talented and innovative people whose invaluable contribution to the local economy is to be credited. And I thank them all. These products, in many cases, have international appeal because of their quality, provenance and taste. And I'd like to highlight just some. Galloway beef from one of the world's longest established breeds of beef cattle. Loch Ryan oysters from Scotland's oldest oyster fishery. Award-winning beer from Sulwath Brewery. And members may be surprised to know that Garachar Tea Garden is growing and blending tea in Dumfries and Galloway. Our award-winning dairy produce is wide-ranging from fresh milk, amazing ice cream and specialist cheeses and yoghurt. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Ayrshire Tatties, but John Scott got there first. I look forward to sampling all of these and many more products at the upcoming Kirkubri Food Festival next month. But before that, I have the Stranraer Oyster Festival this weekend as part of the Food and Drink Fortnight, the first of its kind in Scotland where my new friend Hardeep Singh Kohli has promised to teach me how to properly eat oysters. The South West has whiskey distilleries too, with Bladner's Rebirth and Annandale. And that's Scotch whiskey, not UK whiskey, just to remind everybody. And a brand new gin distillery by the crafty crew at Newton Stewart. So we have some great produce in our neck of the woods as well. I would be happy to take the Cabinet Secretary on a wee d &G tasting tour if he cares to come maybe next summer. <laughs> Key to unlocking the £30 billion potential and supporting the workforce, our farmers, fishermen and women, growers, pickers and all those working in our agricultural sector, it's really important. And I'm sure many of my colleagues across chambers spent the summer recess visiting farms and attending many agricultural events and speaking to the farmers at the front line. I found that the future of staffing on many of the dairy farms is a huge concern. In southwest Scotland, there's 48% of Scotland's dairy farms and many of the dairy farm employees are EU citizens that have chosen to stay here and make it their home. These workers are worried about the future because the UK government does not identify the rural workforce as skilled. And these people are skilled. When I spoke with Andrew McCormick recently on this matter, he told me the NFUS consider these agriculture workers are competent and skilled, and I would agree with that. Presiding officer, as we face the hard worrying realities of Brexit, we must do everything possible to support our rural industries to become more sustainable and resilient, which is exactly what I plan to do as we work towards achieving the government's plan for Scotland's food and drink 2030 and beyond. Thank you. Claire Baker, followed by Willie Coffey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Let me say at the outset how supportive I am of the publication of Ambition 2030. It is great to see this level of partnership working within the food and drink sector, and the bodies are to be commended for their commitment and recognition of the benefits of working together. I am immensely proud of Scotland's farmers, fishermen, food manufacturers, distillers and brewers, innovators and retailers for the hard work that they do and the contribution they make to our daily lives, as well as our culture and our economy. As an MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife, I get ample opportunity to recognise excellence for the high number of food producers and retailers on my doorstep. Our businesses are often highly placed in food and drink awards, and most recently I am delighted to see Tom Court's Butchers in Burnt Island being announced as a finalist in the UK Butcher Shop of the Year, and I wish them all the best in the competition. They are a great example of a high street retailer and have been part of the revival of Burnt Island High Street, which now has a fruit and veg shop and a fishmonger, among many other independent retailers. Ambition 2030 recognises the progress that has been made over the past decade, where we have seen the sector grow into an increasingly important part of our economy. 
It mirrors an international trend with a greater interest in providence, in health and reputation and innovation in food and drink. It has been an important part of our international image and has shown the effectiveness of collaborative working. And I support their efforts to sustainably grow the sector and take advantage of opportunities. Um, I could go on praising the sector and the Food and Drink Federation's reception last week gave me a chance to talk to members about new products, strong brands and the innovative techniques they were pursuing. And the document recognises the importance of flexibility and the need to address challenges. So in the short time I have, I wanted to raise a few issues we need to be alert to. Ambition 2030 recognises the importance of reputation. It is a strong asset, but the horsemeat scandal of a few years ago was a wake-up call to everyone. We do have a strong sector, but it is reliant on having confidence in the regulatory system. There have been big changes to the number and practice of meat inspectors, and we know that the number of environmental health officers has reduced, and they work under pressure where they are more often reacting to situations than being able to do more preventative work. We do need a balance, and I appreciate that by and large the risk is low, but if reputation is at all threatened, it can be very damaging to the sector, so we need to make sure our systems are robust. Of course, Brexit will have a significant impact on the food and drink sector. Uh, the future is uncertain. I recently heard a report about the need for our dairy farmers to diversify. Most of our dairy products are imported and there will be a need to increase productivity in different products. We also we don't know the extent of Brexit and in many of our key products, such as whisky and salmon, we are operating in an international market. But in all the discussion around immigration and movement of people, we need to recognise how reliant the agricultural sector is on European workers. Producers find it difficult to employ Scots to do these jobs. And in the food processing sector, I continually hear from food manufacturers that they struggle to recruit, even though they are paying fair wages and offering attractive terms. We need to make sure the sector is attractive as a career, and I'm pleased to see the emphasis on this in the document. But we need to emphasise to the UK government the importance of the EU workforce in the sector at all levels, and the need to accelerate programmes to present it as a positive career choice. Finally, the document does recognise the need to work with the government and industry to support improvements in diet and nutrition. I know a lot of work has been done on reformatting products and that's to be welcomed, but we do need improvements and consistency on healthy eating messages and food labelling. And while this is largely a celebratory debate, I always find it challenging to talk about food abundance in Scotland <laughs> while recognising the number of people who are suffering from food poverty and relying on food banks to be increasing. Of course, this is about poverty and not about the food sector, but we do need to value a food sector that offers quality and affordability, recognising that many of the products we celebrate today are not always within every family's income bracket, but that the benefits of a good food nation should be available to everyone in Scotland. Thank you. Willie Coffey, followed by George Adam. Thanks very much, President Officer. The motion celebrates the achievements of Scotland's food and drink sector and the huge contribution it makes to Scotland's economy. And it recognises its ever-growing international reputation for quality. Uh, in supporting this, there are, of course, a fantastic local story to tell from Ayrshire and the part that Ayrshire plays in this growing reputation for world-class food and drink. Only last weekend, President Officer, I had the privilege of attending the New Mills Food Festival in the wonderful part of my constituency, the Loudoun Valley. I was astounded at the size of the festival only in its second year, but we saw over 4,000 visitors coming to the tented village in the local Jimison Park. They were able to enjoy a wide range of locally produced food, including chilli from Finnick, ice creams from Galston, speciality canopies from businesses in Kilmarnock, and some amazing, some amazing cake creations from New Mills itself. There were many hot food demonstrations taking place, from a number of creative local businesses with tasting sessions too, and all with the chance to wash it down with some ethical ales from Mochlin. Now, Scotland is well represented with stalls from all over the country, showcasing some fantastic produce and fish, meats, cheeses, and even some interesting gins that seem to be attracting the attention of several of the visitors. Transport was provided to bring people to the event. And local people acted as stewards for the day to help deliver a spectacular event, which has certainly put New Mills on the Good Food Map, Good Food Map of Ayrshire. The organisers, who were all volunteers, and the contributors are to be congratulated for their efforts. That same weekend, presiding officer in Kilmarnock, we had our European market, again principally showcasing quality local and European foods. And we know that this market attracts around 40,000 visits to the town, 
centre to enjoy this kind of experience. I wanted to start with those local stories, President Officer, because they typify the excellent work going on in this crucial sector of our economy. None of this is a happy accident, of course, because we can trace the reasons behind this success of these events to some of the impressive work carried out in East Ayrshire for a number of years now. East Ayrshire has been a pioneer in the localising of the supply chain and procurement of food since 2003, focusing on cooking from fresh, using local produce, and linking this to employment, food education, healthy eating, and even reducing CO2. CO2. East Ayrshire's approach effectively became the benchmark for good practice, particularly in school meals provision, not just in Scotland, but right across Europe. When Food for Life emerged, East Ayrshire was one of a small handful in the public or private sector in the UK to be awarded its gold standard for quality school meals. And indeed, it has consistently met that standard for 10 years. That gold standard means that a service has to demonstrate that the spend is split amongst organic, fair trade, quality meat Scotland, outdoor reared pork, and a few other criteria, as well as fair, there's a fair trade component to that too. It's not always exclusively about 100% uh, local produce. There's a commitment to, to support fair trade nations too in the products that they, they can supply us. We can also find several commendations for the work done by East Ayrshire by no less than the United Nations in their various documents on the power of public procurement. It includes those commitments to sourcing from fair trade nations and it isn't all about exclusive local sourcing. So I'm pleased uh, to hear the Cabinet Secretary mention that the programme for government will be another a further investment of over a million pounds in the Food for Life programme to encourage more or all of our 32 local authorities to achieve that catering hallmark in their schools too. President Officer, the, the national strategy sets a very ambitious target to double the value of the, this industry just beyond the next decade. There are about 115,000 or so people in Scotland directly working in the industry with the prospect of another 20,000 uh, coming along soon in the next decade too. Colleagues have already touched on some of the risks to the success of the strategy. If we don't solve the impending labour issue, where many thousands of people come from Europe, uh, Europe and work here in Scotland within the sector, in much the same way as thousands of Scottish and UK citizens also work in Europe, let's hope that we can persuade the UK government and their deliberations with our European partners that this is a crucial mutual benefit that enriches all of our cultures and benefits all of our econom economies equally. If we achieve that, I'm confident that Scotland's reputation as a world-class producer of food and drink will continue to go from strength to strength. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. I'm always glad to make a speech in Scotland's food and drink because it gives me a chance to talk about the great town of Paisley. And far be it for me to be parochial, but you will be well aware of my pride in my hometown. But it's always good to remind the Chamber of how our town has contributed to Scotland's many successes. Firstly, uh, I listened carefully to Willie Coffey and in particular to John Scott when he spoke about farmers markets and Ayrshire's farmers. What John never mentioned was uh, the famous Paisley farmers market which is full of produce from Ayrshire and uh, the Ayrshire farmers as well. So that's one important part that uh, wasn't mentioned by John when he talked about the work he's done in this field. But I'd also like to talk about in particular Pirelli ice cream. It's the home of luxury Italian ice cream and the previous winners of Renfrewshire Chamber of Commerce family business of the year. The company itself was set up in 1925 by when Gerardo uh, Pirelli immigrated to Scotland from southern Italy. He settled in Paisley and brought ice cream using traditional recipes from his homeland. They now produce high quality Italian ice cream in their state of the art facility in Paisley. Pirelli's produce 6,000 litres of quality product every day, providing it to the catering trade, frozen wholesalers, cash and carries, and multiple retailers. There are one of many successful small businesses in the town. And Paisley has seen an increase due in part to the excitement generated by Paisley's bid for the UK City of Culture. But there has been an increase in the good quality venues for food and drink throughout the town. And many of these businesses are uh, small to medium sized businesses and will be a very important part of the regeneration of Paisley Town Centre. But Bringing people back into the town centre is extremely important and that's where they can help. So you can have your massive chain stores. I'll support the local independent businesses in my area. 
and drink we have Kelvin Brewery who as a small specialist brewers provide an award winning product and although the business is based in Barhead the owners hearts will remain forever in Paisley as they live in my constituency. It is run by Derek Moore and his son Ross and daughter Karen and are constantly uh, competing at various ale festivals throughout Scotland and winning on regular occasions. Our local airport paradoxically called Glasgow International Airport, now promotes Scottish products and its record-breaking numbers of visitors that attend there as well. And we also have Scotland's largest real ale festival in Paisley Town Hall. And sometimes being Paisley's member of the Scottish Parliament can be a difficult job. But on that occasion, it's one that I obviously relish to do as well. But when we talk about food and drink in Scotland, it's not just, as I said earlier, about multi-million pound larger companies. It's about supporting these small independent companies. And that's why I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to invest in new targeted supplier development programme to enable more food and drink suppliers to compete for public contracts. Because this is an issue that often comes up with smaller businesses. And to facilitate attendance at trade fairs and showcase Scotland in particular and encouraging public sector buyers and catering managers to attend and ensuring a supply chain for manufacturers and buyers are closer together. Presiding officer, I could have mentioned a number of food and drink brands that owe their very existence to the town of Paisley. But instead, I led with a small family business of Italian descent that has served and employed Paisley buddies for 92 years. As we look forward to what Scotland can achieve in the worldwide food and drink industry, let's remember the smaller companies that continue to produce excellent quality product here in Scotland. That was a bit of a delayed reaction there. <laughs> we now move to, to the closing speeches, and, and I hope um, anyone who has contributed to the debate and isn't already in the chamber is running here right now. And first of all, can I call Mike Rumbles, please? Up to five minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This has been a good debate this afternoon. Uh, I know lots of times you say that, but this generally has been a good debate. All contributors took the opportunity to highlight the successes of the food and drink industry in their own constituencies and regions, and quite right, too. I'd like to comment on summing up on some of the contributions this afternoon. I can't mention everybody, but uh, I would like to highlight some of them. Um, I'd like to agree with Fergus Ewing. He's not here, for, here to hear me say that. I'd say that again. I'd like to hear, uh, I'd like to agree, oh, he is at the back. Probably can't hear me anyway. I'd like to agree uh, uh, with Fergus Ewing. I'd like to agree with him all the time, but that's not possible. Um, but he did say the bedrock of our industry is about primary producers, our farmers, fishermen, and crofters. Of course it is, but there is indeed more than this. And that is, of course, the focus of my amendment tonight. We all want to see the government's food and drink strategy succeed. That is why we need to ensure that our producers, environmentalists, and our consumers really do need to be part of designing a new bespoke system of agricultural support. Edward Mountain championed the high quality produce locally produced and delivered a well-crafted and measured contribution to this debate. And the Liberal Democrats will be supporting his amendment uh, this evening at decision time. Rhoda Grant, we need to showcase our local produce. Too often our pubs are limited on what they can sell. Her amendment is a good one, designed to increase the share of Scottish brewed products in Scotland's pubs. Uh, the Liberal Democrats, again, are very happy to support the Labour amendment. Graham Day took the opportunity, quite rightly, to highlight the successes and innovation of the food and drink industry in his Angus constituency. Brian Whittle, our food and drink strategy should have a lot to do with our health strategy. Absolutely right. Nutritious food for our hospitals, schools, for instance. Gail Ross, the issue of skilled workers in the food and drink industry needs to be addressed. How to fill these job opportunities, especially leaving the EU. We need to show our young people that a career in the industry is a valuable and rewarding one. Marie Goujon, well, I hope I got that right, was was clearly excited about promoting and selling our local produce for her constituency of Angus North and the men's. She was so enthusiastic about this, she was smiling, and she is now almost throughout her contribution. She mentioned that she rep now represented the men's, and as I used to be the constituency member for the men's before the Boundary Commission came along, 
I concur, what a great place it is too. Present, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope that my amendment to the Government's motion is supported by Parliament tonight. I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will not in a future debate turn round in eight months' time and say, as he did earlier on today, that I had misinterpreted my own amendment. My amendment tonight, just like my amendment accepted by Parliament in January, was not prescriptive. It isn't, but it was clear. Just as my amendment tonight is clear, this National Council of Rural Advisers does not meet the expectations agreed by Parliament on the 19th of January, and it urges the Scottish Government to expand it to include the broadest possible range of experts and stakeholders, including producers, environmentalists, and consumer groups, in designing a bespoke system of agricultural support that Scotland will need, particularly in the event of Brexit, for the food and drink strategy to be a success. We've got to design a new system, and we really need to make sure that everybody has a buy-in to it. Only like by that can a new system be designed that will succeed. Cabinet Secretary, that should be, my amendment should be clear enough and cannot, in my view, possibly be misinterpreted. I call Neil Bibby for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I refer to my <coughs> Member's Register of Interest. Um, I welcome the opportunity to close the debate on Scotland's food and drink strategy on behalf of Scottish Labour. And I agree with Mike Rumbles that this has been a very good debate and every contribution has been uh, excellent. There's been a wide range of uh, contributions and members talking about uh, local produce they have a knowledge of. And I've got to say I'm feeling quite hungry after uh, all the chat about food today. Um, George Adam made a, a, an excellent point about uh, Pirelli's ice cream from Paisley, and there was a number of other uh, important contributions today. Rhoda Grant made excellent points on uh, food poverty, Brian Whittle about local procurement, uh, Gail Ross and Claire Baker about, um, about nutrition, Willie Coffey about uh, fair trade, and, 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 and many, many others as well. One of the key points um, made today that we can all agree on is that Scotland's world-renowned food and drink is as integral to our culture and identity as our music, our sport and our heritage. Um, as Rhoda Grant said, we know that Scotland already produces some of the most sought after natural produce in the world. Not only do we export food and drink far and wide, but people come from far and wide to experience it here in Scotland. Scotland's coastal communities also provide, uh, produce quality fish and shellfish. We are now one of the largest seafood producers in Europe. With such impressive natural resources, it's little wonder that food and drink is our fastest growing export sector. But we shouldn't just pat ourselves on the, on the back. We can and must do more. The food and drink strategy acknowledges this. It aspires to build upon Scotland's developing reputation as a land of food and drink to grow tourism, as well as increase sales and exports. And as been said, the strategy has an ambitious target to double the turnover in the sector by 2030. This would make Food and Drink Scotland's most valuable industry. And as we've heard, collaboration is vital to achieving that aim. The strategy is right to say that the industry must deepen collaboration along the whole supply chain from end to end. And the strategy is also right to say that we must diversify our markets and our customer base, as this will support resilience in the sector. And I'll speak more about these points in relation to the brewing industry later. Uh, a number of members, Claire Baker, Rhoda Grant, Mary Goujon, have mentioned Brexit in this debate today, uh, and they are right to raise concerns about the impact that it could have. Uh, we believe that we need to see a Brexit deal that prioritises jobs and the economy. It is well established that whisky is Scotland's biggest export, currently accounting for 80% of Scotland's food and drink export market, and it's vital that the interests of whisky industry and others are represented in the Brexit negotiations. In addition to whisky, the brewing and distilling industry in Scotland continues to manufacture new products. Scotland is becoming a world-leading producer of craft beers and boutique gins. In the last year alone, there was a 50% spike in gin producers, whilst the brewing industry saw the growth of 20 additional small or micro uh, breweries. There are now over 120 breweries in Scotland producing a wide uh, variety of specialist beers, including uh, Arran, 
uh, Brewery, Loch Lomond Brewery and Kelvin Brewery, as, as George Adam mentioned, uh, in my own region. No matter what part of the country uh, you, you're from, you can choose to visit. Uh, you're never far from a good local beer. The purpose of Labour's amendment today is to agree that we should increase the share of Scottish brewed products in our pubs. It is important that the Scottish Government and other agencies take measures to encourage pubs to sell locally uh, brewed products. One of the measures that we propose is reforming the Tide pub sector in Scotland. As Rhoda Grant said, the contractual agreements between pubs and their pub company owners can require that they stock certain products, often multinational brands, and means they cannot source beers direct from local brewers. The campaign for Rio Ale and others believe that the model unfairly disadvantages smaller local brewers who find themselves blocked out of the Tide pub sector. It has been estimated that over £30 million could be leaving the Scottish economy every year as a result of the Tide pub model. I am proposing a Members' Bill on Tide pubs because there are basic issues of fairness for publicans, but I am also doing it because if we are serious about giving Scottish consumers more choice and we are serious uh, about supporting jobs in the brewing industry, then we should reform Tide pubs. We should allow pubs the freedom to source locally brewed products on the open market and help them support our local economies. I am pleased to say the proposal has uh, received backing from CAMRA, the Scottish Licensed Trade Association, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Scottish Tourism Alliance and GMB Scotland, as well as many Thai publicans and brewers in constituencies across Scotland. They all believe such a proposal would be good for Scotland's uh, brewers, pubs and economy, and I hope uh, we, it can receive cross-party support in this chamber going forward. In closing, Presiding Officer, I will just quote directly from the strategy. Um, Political upheavals like Brexit bring uncertainty. They always do. But we can't sit back and wait for camel waters. Our competitors won't do that. There's much in our world that we can't control, but also much that we can. We can. And I think that sums up not only the strategy, presiding officer, uh, but uh, the tone of debate from members today. Thank you. Call Peter Chapman up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, once again, I refer members to my register of interest. This has been a good debate, on the whole, consensual and good humoured. And this debate is timely, coming as it does during Food and Drink Fortnight, when we celebrate and promote Scotland's reputation as a source of some of the finest food and drink found anywhere in the world. We have indeed a fine story to tell. The Scotland Food and Drink Partnership was launched in 2007 and it is a membership-based organisation founded by industry and the public sector and led by a young, talented and energetic chief executive in James Withers. In the 10 years to 2017, it has had great success in growing our food and drink sector and raising the profile of the industry. Since 2007, Industry turnover is up 44% to 14 billion. Exports have risen by 56% to 5.5 billion. The sector employs 119,000 people and the sector has grown at twice the rate of the rest of manufacturing in Scotland. But the target now is ambitious. The target is to build on that successful base and double the turnover to 30 billion by 2030. Now that past success and our ability to meet the new target is dependent on continuing the model of collaboration right across the supply chain. Sharing progress and best practice to help smaller businesses to grow, unlocking new marketing opportunities and uniting behind a joint mission to grow the business. Our reputation and our brand has been our strongest asset. Scotland is rightly seen right across the world as a producer of the best food and drink, underpinned by our, our focus on provenance and quality. And Brian Whittle stressed in his uh, contribution that, uh, this and agreed and argued that Scotland, Scottish Government must do more to supply our fine food to our schools and our hospitals and our care homes, etc. Diversity is also one of our assets. We are blessed with a diverse natural larder and a diverse business base. We are fortunate to have some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. And our fine fish, crabs and lobsters are in great demand. And farmed salmon is our biggest food export. 
and it is found in the finest menus worldwide. Our fishermen are at last enjoying good catches and good prices, and there is an optimis optimism in the sector not seen for many long years. And there is whisky. Whisky is worth five billion to the economy and is actually 80% of our food and drink exports, worth four billion pounds. It is indeed the UK's largest net contributor to our balance of trade. Whisky production supports 40,000 jobs across the UK and employs 7,000 in remote rural parts of Scotland. It spends 1.7 billion on its supply chain, 80% of which is, is spent in Scotland. Whisky is a great success story. Absolutely. And its future is bright as the premium alcoholic drink across the globe. Now, you might be surprised that I haven't mentioned farming yet. Our farmers are, of course, a vital part of the food and drink success. Farmers produce much of the raw material on which the rest of the chain depends. Be it malting barley for whiskey, or beef, lamb and pork, produced to some of the highest ethical and welfare standards in the world. Similarly, our dairy products, cheese, yogurt and butter, or our fruit and veg, which of course are finding ready markets at home and abroad, and they are celebrated for their great taste. We have many of the finest farmers found anywhere, skilled, hardworking, innovative, and determined. But that hard work and that skill is poorly rewarded. And that truth was recognized by my colleagues, John Scott and Edward Mountain, and indeed it was also recognized by the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing. Much more of the success of our food and drink sector needs to flow down to the primary producer who supplies the raw material on which it all depends. I am fed up saying it, and I wish it wasn't true, but our official government statistics tell us the average income for Scottish farmers was only £12,600 last year. Now that's £12,600 after receiving their CAP support. A pittance for all that hard work and innovation. That is well below the minimum wage for a 40-hour week, let alone a 60- or 70-hour week that most of our farmers work. Now, we have had many rows across this chamber in the past 18 months about IT systems and delays and vital cap money. But every farmer, every farmer, I can tell you now, would forgo that money tomorrow if you could only get a fair return from the marketplace. And I wonder, I wonder whether that will ever happen. I hope to see it, but I don't know. So I am enthusiastic for the £30 billion target by 2030. By growing our food and drink industry, more will be demanded of our farmers. And supply and demand tells me that should result in better prices. Now, exports have been a success for our industry, but we must never forget our biggest and best market is our home market in Scotland and the rest of the UK. 90% of the beef that we produce in Scotland is exported, and 90% of that export go into England. Our internal single market is vital, and we need to remember that during all the talk around Brexit. Presiding officer, this has been a good debate, consensual and optimistic for the most part, and I have enjoyed listening to it and taking part in it. And if only I had a dram to add to this water, the toast would be, here's to future success. Thank you. I think that's a habit we won't try and get into. <laughs> and I call on Fergus Ewing to close this debate. Nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I will get myself in trouble, but that's a very unfortunate ruling, presiding officer. <laughs> Um, this has been an excellent debate, as uh, many members have said, and it's great to see a recognition across the Chamber of the great success story that is Scotland's food and drink, and also, I think, the support for the new, uh, the new strategy of Scotland Food and Drink, Ambition 230. I think the fact that there is such broad-based support for that strategy bodes well uh, in helping us move towards achieving it. 
And I was also pleased to hear so many members paying tribute to producers and local businesses, in particular farmers and fishermen, who are very often left out of the narrative. And I think that was not the case today, as Mr. Chapman uh, uh, illustrated, as, and many others. Uh, and I was pleased that Mr. Rumbles focused on the whisky industry, a great success story for Scotland. And not only the big boys as it were, but also the craft distillers and the the uh, real flourishing of the dis dis distillation of fine Scottish gins. And I'm delighted that uh, bodies such as HIE have managed to support in a concrete way the creation of these new distilleries uh, around the country, but particularly in the Highlands and Islands, which, uh, uh, which I especially welcome. And I was pleased that James Withers and his team at Scotland Food and Drink uh, had tribute paid to them, and I would echo that. Um, I want just to run through quickly some of the Scottish Government's specific support for the sector. Uh, £65 million through our Food Processing and Marketing Cooperation Grant Scheme, supporting 220 projects. £85 million allocated through the European Fisheries Fund to support 1,000 seafood and fisheries projects. I visited Scrabster a week ago last Monday to give financial support to the ice factory there which will help Scrabster maintain and strengthen its position as the UK's second largest white fish uh, port. 3.5 million to support the delivery of the Scottish export plan led by SDI. 3 million to support Connect Local, the advisory services for micro businesses. A 3 million investment in education related projects, including the successful Food for Life program operating in schools across Scotland with uh, uh, with East Ayrshire, as Willie Coffey said, really leading the way in this regard, and I'll be celebrating the 10 years of success with them in November. £1 million community fund to support producers and communities celebrate local food through events. And I think uh, Mr. Scott made a good point about looking to regionalise our effort in that regard generally in many ways, and that's something that we will look at carefully and uh, be happy to work with him on that. And £10 million 10 million investment with industry to support the delivery of Ambition 2030. We've also worked with retailers, with the business, with primary producers, and uh, credit is due to many of them. For example, the co-op in Morrisons are committed to sourcing 100% of their fresh meat from the UK and Scotland. What a good example. Uh, I hope that the others will look carefully at that. Uh, Often the difficulty about that is practical, the difficulty of getting enough meat on the shelves from producers reliably day after day. And what I think we're all aware of these important practical matters. Uh, Bid Food committed to doubling the value of their Scottish range. Aldi's has reduced its payment terms to suppliers from 33 days to 14 days. Payment in 14 days, benefiting 90 small businesses in Scotland. That's a, a great thing. M&S committed to stocking Scottish lamb all year round. Um, now, uh, Brian Whittle, I think, mentioned local sourcing first, and he, I think he made an interesting and valuable contribution uh, to that. Of course, there are some things that's difficult to source, and that was highlighted by the BBC. Poultry, for example, is typically uh, more expensive in Scotland, and supply is not, not sufficient for our needs, not even for the supermarkets. So that's a practical matter, which constrains the ability for us to supply all the needs, I'll certainly give way. Brian Whittle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for allowing intervention. Will we agree, though, that it's a supply and demand issue here? If you create the demand, uh, our Scottish farmers will, will, will feed into that and uh, supply to that. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I do. I, I'm a supporter of, uh, of a regulated market, but, but I think the point is there's not enough Scottish chicken produced to meet demand. Uh, much of it is bought by the main retailers, and even they can't get enough. But Discussions are ongoing with primary producers with the potential for upscaling production, something that I think we both wish to see. And cheese, not much cheese, Scottish cheese is bought by the public sector. Uh, much is bought and imported from Ireland. This is due to cost. They have a wide range of commodity, i.e. cheaper products, whereas Scotland produces more high value premium. Uh, but again, this is something that I know is being looked at uh, carefully. The point I'm making is these are partly business, partly commercial matters where there are practical considerations apply. And I don't think we can make it mandatory to buy Scottish or British. I don't think that would be practical. For example, food and vegetables are excellent in Scotland, high quality, but they're not available all year round. Uh, so one must bear in mind the practicalities here. However, what we have done 
uh, in the local sourcing issue is a number of things. Um, I, I think it was Marie Dujon that said the importance of obtaining accreditation status for, for businesses that can get into procurement contracts. Uh, and we have a programme which is working intensively with 30 businesses to increase their capacity. We're investing £100,000 in that. The expansion of the Food for Life programme, investing £400,000, will be a key factor in driving more local sourcing. Uh, uh, and we are uh, doing a, num a number of other things to promote local sourcing of food. In terms of marketing, our 2017 National Showcasing Scotland event is being held in a couple of weeks in Perthshire. Over 160 businesses will be showcasing their products to over 120 international and domestic buyers. Uh, we will replicate this model by having regional showcasing events across Scotland uh, uh, and more details of that will follow uh, in due course. The success abroad has been considerable. I gave some examples earlier. Uh, for example, in August, uh, other, ex other examples are that in the USA, Mull of Kintyre Cheddar was launched to over 1,100 Publix stores in the southeast states of the USA. In Hong Kong, a Scottish gin company is expected to sell 1.5 million of product over the next three years. In China, certainly will. John Scott. Sorry, John Scott. The enormous opportunity exists for Prestwick Airport in terms of being one of the freight hubs in Scotland uh, to export our high quality produce um, as opportunities grow. Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to uh, agree to uh, in that much delayed intervention from Mr Scott and happy to work with him there and end. Uh, we also want to focus on the UK market. There's uh, 50 million in England, 10 million in London alone. This is an important market and we're Scotland Food and Drink are to publish an action plan setting out a further range of measures there. Brexit has been mentioned by many, and of course, uh, the threat to loss of the essential skilled labour and unskilled labour that serves in the food and drink industry is clear. In the soft fruit and veg sector, we have uh, 15,000 non-UK seasonal workers employed in Scottish farms. Uh, Angus Soft Fruits have expressed concern about this. In the bakery trade, one third are EU nationals. In seafood processing, 70% from the EU. Uh, a survey of the Scottish Association of Meat Wholesalers showed that 52% of their unskilled workforce uh, and 44% of the skilled workforce come from the EU. Uh, and John Scott quite re rightly mentioned the sustainability of Scottish abattoirs in terms of the amount of, of, uh, of uh, livestock that they receive. But there is also the fact that, for, that there may be 90% of the OVs who are necessary for the functioning of abattoirs come from the EU. I don't want to make political points in this debate, but there is a real worry about the continued availability of labour. And frankly, the sooner we have clarity on that issue, frankly, the better. A presiding officer, uh, I think this has been an excellent debate today. I'm grateful to all members to, uh, who have contributed, and I look forward to seeing even greater success in the Scotland food and drink sector. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary and members. There are, uh, that concludes our debate sorry, on Scotland's food and drink strategy. We move now to decision time, and there are four questions today. The first question is that Amendment 7641.3 in the name of Edward Mountain, which seeks to amend the motion 7641 in the name of Fergus Ewing on Scotland's food and drink strategy be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 7641.3 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 32, no, 64. There were 15 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 7641.1 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 7641.2 in the name of Mike Rumbles, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing, are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment 7641.2 in the name of Mike Rumbles is yes, 53, no, 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 7641 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended on Scotland's food and drink strategy be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>